tecnologia para nós é o começo, o princípio de tudo. Por isso que nós estamos dentro de um ambiente desse, com quase 500 laboratórios e áreas do conhecimento em todas as áreas do conhecimento humano para disponibilizar, oferecer para o empresário, fazer nascer a sua ideia já dentro desse ambiente de tecnologia. Nós temos muitas ideias que crescem, ficam muito bonita dentro de um plano de negócio, mas não consegue mercado. Isto não é inovação. Inovação é geração de recursos, dinheiro no caixa dos empreendedores para o negócio crescer. Não dá para desassociar mais tecnologia e inovação. Sem humor não se gera inovação. Quem diz isso? Astro Teller, que nós temos a honra de convidar para vir contar um pouquinho para nós mais de ambientes de inovação. Bem-vindo, Astro Teller. Bom dia, bom dia. Eu também não sou Astro Teller. Sou Emanuel Evita, gerente de Relações Públicas para Google Brasil. E quando me falaram que teria a oportunidade para entrevistar Astro, que vai conectar pelo Hangout, eu tinha bastante sentimentos. Primeiro, como trabalho com imprensa, não conheço muito de Astro, ou seja, Astro trabalha para aquela equipe que está fazendo tanta inovação, tanta pesquisa, que não tem tempo para falar com a imprensa. E pensei, quais seriam as coisas que eu ia falar com ele? Né? Só que não achava que a primeira oportunidade que ia ter ia ser num palco com 300 pessoas uh, um, observando. Então, nos dá uns momentos e, em breve, começamos a falar com o Astro. Astro, are you seeing me? So, I've got to tell you, you're on a... Uh, I'm looking at you on a computer, we're on a stage. There are about 300 people watching you. Um, so I didn't want to give hello, you any pressure. You got an enthusiastic hello. <laughs> Excellent. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. So um, Astro, today we've been talking a lot about innovation. And I mentioned to the audience that uh, when I when I knew that I would get a chance to interview you, you know, interview one of the people who is actually part of the projects that really represent what innovation is at Google, and the fact that I'd be able to talk to someone whose name was Astro, <coughs> and I, I, I let them know that I didn't know really uh, you know, what to ask. And so um, one, of, one of the questions I thought that you might be able to tell us is uh, talk about is you know, how do you uh, view innovation. Uh, you know, we've talked about it from several different angles, uh, but I, I wanted to get your your perspective. So, I feel pretty strongly, and there, not everyone agrees with this view of the world, but I feel pretty strongly that innovation, in order to have meaning as a word, needs to mean something other than improvement. So there are lots of people who spend their days making things better. And that's great, and they should continue to do that. But that is not innovation. Innovation is, by definition, moving forward in some positive dimension that is qualitatively different than improvement. And I think the thing that separates innovation from improvement is whether or not it is uh, a departure in assumptions. In other words, is it an evolution or a revolution? If you take something and you make it better by using all of the same assumptions, but improving some aspect of it in some small but important way, that's an improvement. And innovation is when you tear down part of the, perce the perception of the problem, change the perception of what the problem is, and by changing that perspective, you can then come to a conclusion which is radically better. So put in the most simple terms, one way I like to think of it is if you're trying to make it 10% better, you're doing improvement. If you're trying to make it 10 times better, you're doing innovation. 
So, so Astrid, it actually seems like when you think about innovation, innovation is all about asking the right question before starting whatever type of research or effort that you you have a t that you want to uh, take forward. So, so can you talk about kind of in practical ways how phrasing the question really impacts the way that we might focus, that Google might focus on things that your team does? Sure, so I, I gave a first example just then, a mantra of what are we making 10 times better? If there's not something that we can point at and say, we're gonna make that 10 times better, we really shouldn't start. So that's an example of a mantra. Uh, but there are other things that we could practice doing, like saying, of the five or six basic assumptions that people have made about how a problem gets solved, uh, which one could we break? So let's say you were looking at the transportation industry and you were saying, okay, how do we get fuel efficiency better so that we hurt the planet less when we move people around? Well, one of the basic ways that you could approach such a problem is to say, why do we need to move people around? There, that's an assumption that was baked into the question. It is the process of rejecting the question that has is, is historically been asked, finding examples like that, and then you go down that path and you say, all right, how hard could we push on not moving people around? What are the ways in which we could break that assumption? And maybe it works and maybe it doesn't work. Often it doesn't work. And so you have to say, well, that was a failed experiment. And then you move on and you try it again. But uh, I try to help teams spend a lot of their energy failing as fast as they can, asking questions, being audacious, and then when it doesn't work out, and it usually doesn't work out, that's fine. Recognize it, learn from what didn't work, and restart, try again. You know, we talked a little bit uh, yesterday about, I mentioned to you kind of the driverless cars. And in fact, you know, for the audience, something really interesting is that, you know, still it happens to me every day that I, I find out something that we're working on in Google and I say, wow, we're working on that in Google? And then I say, can we talk to press about it? And, and so um, when I was focusing on this with you, when we were talking, you said, uh, you know, driverless cars are interesting, but you're not really getting to the heart of what we think about when we think about problems that we're solving, problems that we're solving. So can you, right. can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Sure. So, uh, I, I mean, driverless cars are amazing. I do believe that they will change the world. I'm very proud that they're that we're working on them here. But they're an instance drawn from a class. The class of problems, of, of things that we are interested in, and that I think generally everybody should be interested in, has these three major components. First, there has to be some huge problem in the world. So imagine like a Venn diagram of three circles I'm gonna to describe to you. And what we're focused on is the intersection of those three circles. So the first one is, what's the enormous problem? If there's not an enormous problem to solve, some way that you can concretely say the world can be made better, and not made better for a few people, but for like a billion or more people. Uh, if you can't say that, you're not working on the right problem. Even if you can say that, then number two, the second circle, you have to be able to say, here is a proposal, a radical proposal for how to create that benefit or make that problem. It sounds like science fiction, but I think it can be done. And so that could be um, a product or it could be a service. And then even if you have the problem and you have a radical proposal for how to solve the problem, you have to have some way to do the thing that sounds impossible. So at least from Google's perspective, this usually plays out as a piece of breakthrough science or technology that we uh, either invent ourselves or we find the inventor at a university and we work with them. You have to do all three of those things. And so the driverless cars is very specifically, it's a beautiful instance from that class. Huge problem, you know, a trillion dollars a year wasted sitting in traffic every year. A million people die in car accidents every year. What's the radical product or service? It's cars that drive themselves. And then there's a set of technologies, some of which have been invented at Google, many of which were actually first 
um, developed within university settings, but there are a set of technologies that have, over the last couple of years, made it clear that it's possible, not easy, but possible to build this radical sounding thing. Now, how can we do that in agriculture? How can we do that in healthcare? How can we do that in the construction industry or manufacturing or anything else? That's the big question. So a lot of the people that are here in the audience are associated with uh, uh, digital media agencies, uh, businesses that are thinking about uh, getting online or at least uh, expanding their presence or their brands online. And so I, I think you know, talking about innovation is, is innovation, the word almost loses its meaning because it's a buzzword. It's a buzzword here in Brazil, it's a buzzword in the United States. But how do, how do you bring concepts of motivating your teams to create radical change, radical change, transformation, and innovate uh, within their organizations? Do you have, you have any thoughts, any tips on that? Sure. So, I mean, not everyone has to be innovating. You can think of the continuum for, uh, through improvement and innovation, sort of like you might think about your portfolio all allocation for your stocks. It's okay to have some of your money in safe stocks or in bonds or even keep some of your money in cash. But it's smart, assuming you have more than a small amount of money, to have some of your money allocated to very risky things that may pay off really well. We all understand that clearly in the world of investing, but we're not nearly as clear about that when it comes to making things better. So to have some of your people working in any organization, taking what you already have and making it a little bit better for tomorrow, awesome. That probably should be more than half of your people, almost no matter what your business is. But to take a set of people and put them on the side and to say, your job is to break rules including our rules, and we're going to be angry at you. You need to give this group one person who knows that their job, this is kind of part of what I do at Google, is to protect these people when people get angry at them. Then you need to tell them, don't worry about our current business. You need to assume that our current business is going away. I mean, Google's business is not going away, but in order to be innovative, you need to free yourself from the constraints of trying to help the business as it currently is and say to them, go figure out problems for which we have some advantage, some reason that we could, beyond just having money, that we can make progress in helping. Because we've noticed, for example, that this problem looks unsolvable with the tools from this industry, but this other industry has nothing to do with it, has solved a sort of similar problem. We can transplant the solution that they had here by analogy over there. Just observing that or having access to data that people hadn't seen before can unlock an observation, which can give a team the opportunity to go build it. So you have to tell them it's their job. You have to create incentives. I mean, financial incentives. So you pay them to kill the projects. You have literally, you have celebrations when projects are ended, because if you don't, then you have um, a few good projects, people become emotionally attached to them, and you get bogged down in improvements, and you, you've lost your innovation process. So I can give you more examples, but does that give you a, a few? No, that, 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 that was great. So you're, you're saying that organizations need to create some type of incentive, maybe even financial, uh, to be risky within that organization and to fail within that organization in order to transform and to innovate. Yes, and there, there are lots of processes and bureaucracy in large corporations for lots of good reasons. It is still the case that there needs to be corners of the organization which are freed from those constraints. It doesn't mean they can spend whatever they want. It doesn't mean that they can do something which is illegal or unsafe, but it does mean that they need to not have the same mission as the rest of the group. If your mission is to sell more um, widgets to the world, then guess what? Everyone in your organization is gonna be trying to figure out how to either make more widgets or sell those widgets better. And it might turn out that the, that's the wrong perspective. We should be giving the widgets away. And then if we do that in the right way, we can actually make 10 times as much money. 
but that organization is not going to get behind giving your widgets away. So you need to create a little corner where people can say things like that without getting fired. Okay, I have, uh, <laughs> I have uh, one more question. We have a couple minutes, maybe about three minutes. Uh, could you tell me about one of the most interesting projects uh, for you from a scientific standpoint that you've worked on uh, either at Google or in all of your other uh, efforts? Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll give um, a meta example. I can give a few examples from my previous life before I was at Google. It's just for confidentiality reasons, sure. it's easier for me to talk about these things. I believe that the future of knowledge work is very analogous to what happened to the industrialization of goods about 100 years ago. So there was a, a time when the suggestion that factories would make things instead of people making things was an incredibly frightening suggestion. And so it sounds frightening for me to say, computers are going to start making the ideas, not the people. Now, don't panic. I don't mean to suggest that people will no longer have a role, but in the same way, that when factories started making things, it changed people's jobs from individually screwing things and like being a craftsman of a car or a gun or whatever it was that, that we were making one of, to having people scurrying all over the factory. They worked on the factory and then the factory worked on the things. It actually takes almost as many people as it used to to run a factory. It's just the people are doing very different things than they used to. We're going to be in that situation within one generation at the latest with respect to making ideas. And in two of my previous businesses, one was a wearable body monitoring company and one was an AI based hedge fund. I have in different ways actually worked on the process of getting people away from making the ideas and thinking, helping them to think about making a factory for ideas where the software can take on more and more of the job of making the ideas themselves. So that's something I've worked on specifically, but that I also believe philosophically will play out at lots of companies, including I, I'm willing to bet at Google. Thank you very much, Astro. We appreciate your time. My Thank pleasure. You.